All right, welcome to the next video. What I want to talk to you about today is the Bitcoin happening. So today it should be the Bitcoin happening. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if it's going to be today because I'm filming this a little bit earlier. I plan on posting it tomorrow. So hopefully today is the Bitcoin happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw something on Twitter, I believe, which showed that this was one of the more Googled trends about Bitcoin in, you know, I don't know, a couple of months. And I thought it would be good to make a video about it, although I'm sort of skipping ahead in terms of the type of videos I've been making. So if you're watching that from far in the future, that doesn't matter. If you're watching that uh, in July or, you know, May of 2020, um, this won't be in the normal sequence of the videos that I'm making. I hope that makes sense. All right. So while I'm caffeinated, let's get into it. What does the Bitcoin happening mean for Bitcoin? All right. Well, before we can say what the Bitcoin happening means for Bitcoin, I want to give context as to why this event exists in Bitcoin at all. All right, and this is a beautiful website. Um, you can find it at burr.money. And what this is, is one of the most successful Federal Reserve memes, if not the most successful Federal Reserve meme I've ever seen. Um, this is a, it kind of speaks for itself, but it's basically the Fed just massively printing money with bloody tears running down its eyes trying to pump up the stock market. All right, so what does this mean? This means that it's become normal Fed policy to print an absurd amount of money, and by, it's absurd by my standards, I'm sure they wouldn't consider it absurd, an absurd amount of money to pump up or to, to push the economy, to prop up the economy. Uh, now, although this is a meme, I think it conveys the message quite well. So if we wanna be maybe more objective or more academic about it, we could just go to the data. So this is the total public debt documented by the Federal Reserve. You can also check out this graph there at fed.stlouisfed.org. Not super interesting, but we see the trend here. It goes up over the years. So we're looking at a graph from about 2009 to 2020, just pretty steadily it goes up. If you wanna understand how monetary policy is going in the US, you could also look at the inflation of the M1 money supply. Uh, they like to break up the, what they actually label as the money supply in different ways. M1 just represents the most liquid wealth. So stuff that would, is in like checking accounts and stuff like that. Again, this is from the same time period, 2009 to 2020. The reason why I'm picking this is it's because I wanted to look at the time period from the last major financial crisis, also the time that the original Bitcoin network was launched, up to present day. All right, so about 10 years for you there. I think a more interesting and more significant piece of data that we could be looking at is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Let me pull this a little bit closer. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve is the most interesting to me because this actually represents how much money they're creating. Um, you'll see here, this is pretty much just straight up as well, with the exception of during the uh, financial crisis, everyone seems to have, you know, become more liquid in their assets, which isn't at all surprising. What this shows is what, how much money the Federal Reserve is willing to create. And you'll see that the gray portion represents the last economic crisis, 2008-2009. Uh, they'll probably have to gray out this time period too, but what you can see here is just this almost direct shot up. When there's a crisis, you can expect that they're gonna print money, all right? That's the sort of um, standard that the Fed is setting. Another thing to notice about this is that um, the trend isn't as clear here. So you'll see that it's not like a straight line. There's nothing predictable about this. Well, it's sort of predictable in when we have an economic collapse, they print more money but it's not steady, right? So we're here at the end of this chart. Uh, we don't know what the policy of the Fed is gonna be in the next one, two, three, five, 10, 50 years, right? It's, it's unknown. So when we look at this graph, I would describe this as unstable and an unknown rate of inflation. Okay, now let's compare that to Bitcoin. So this is a graph that you can look up at uh, a GitHub link that I've provided here. This is functionally the inflation and the monetary supply of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has an inflation rate that goes like this, right? It's just boop. And as if you can hear the sound, boop, 
Anyway, you're going to have to look at it. The sound doesn't tell you which direction it's going. So this is over the period of 2009 to 2064. Okay, and we can zoom in. Helps, uh, if that helps you look at it. So we are here. Now, what's significantly different about, about this compared to the previous graph that we're looking at from the Fed? Okay, the, first of all, this is very pretty, right? It's, it's almost as if the inflation rate is known, right? This has a known inflation rate. If we include this little stepping portion, you'll look on the right-hand side, what I've included here is the monetary inflation by percentage, okay? So basically, every happening, the inflation of Bitcoin is halved. When Bitcoin first started, there were no Bitcoins in the network, right? So we need a way of bringing all of the supply of the currency into the network. We do this through inflation. Some people think Bitcoin is deflationary, which is just not true. It's actually an inflationary uh, currency, but the inflation rate is known and predictable and there's no human interference that goes on to change that, in, that inflation. Okay. So this right here is the current happening. Now, what are the things we can say about this graph compared to the previous one by the Fed? Okay, this compared to the Fed is stable and known, right? We have a stable and known rate of inflation. That's everything. Okay, now people tend to get really, really excited about the happening. There's really no reason to. Um, it's an event that's known so to me, it's sort of like, why get excited about it? People are going to get excited. Who am I to tell them not to? But, um, I, you know, there's some correlations between this and price, which I'm not going to discuss here. All right. This is the more important part of, of what I want to talk about, about the happening. Okay. So this is what I call the alchemy of Bitcoin, right? This is from my book. Basically, this animation is showing that what miners are doing is they're spending money on electricity and machines to do work that, and we call that mining. Okay, and what they're doing is they're trading their off-chain resources for on-chain Bitcoin. And they do that because the reward of Bitcoin is valuable. This process is what makes Bitcoin valuable. So if we, you know, if, if you look at the current code, it can be a little bit complex. So we're just going to go back to the original Bitcoin source code and look at this particular file. I don't normally like to include code, but I think that this is pretty straightforward. So why not? Here we're looking at uh, what the reward is that some that miners are getting in, in a block, right? So get block value is the function and it returns a subsidy and the fees. So what this is saying is that there's two components to being rewarded for the process of mining. This thing called a subsidy and this thing called fees. All right, so in order for the alchemy of mining to be profitable, we need to have, we need to have the reward pay more than what they're paying to actually do the process in the first place. So here's an example, right? The mining costs are not profitable. People don't mine blocks. When things are profitable, right? Then you have, then you have the producing of blocks, which you'll see in the animation in the background. This is what, this is the interesting part here, okay? So for the entire time of Bitcoin's existence, the subsidy has made up the vast majority of what is paid out as incentive for miners. But as we move into this new happening, more of the network is gonna have to come to rely on fees because the subsidy being paid out in the issuance of new Bitcoin is depleting. So every four years, the, we saw that step off in the graph. Every four years, the subsidy is decreased by half. So therefore, fees have to make up a greater percentage proportion of that incentive to do the mining. If that is not a, if this, if it's not profitable for miners to mine, uh, they won't. All right, now the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is it's not just a straight binary thing. Miners are mining or they're not. It's, there, there's sort of an equilibrium that has to be reached. So when mining isn't profitable, miners drop off. Okay, and that increases the relative share of hash power for the miners that are choosing to mine, right? So really, again, it's not about like never being profitable. B Bitcoin will find an equilibrium. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because as this does relate to price, what mining is, is it's a bid on buying Bitcoins in the form of receiving that incentive to produce the block. If it's a bid on Bitcoins, they, 
mining has some say in what the price of Bitcoin is. Um, people aren't going to altruistically mine Bitcoins at a loss forever. So the, the price will have to, if, if the price shoots up, mining becomes more profitable. But as the price of Bitcoin comes down and mining becomes less profitable, you have some miners will fall off until we reach some threshold where it's profitable for the small existing miners that stay on the network. Okay, so uh, I think that pretty much covers everything I wanted to talk about when it comes to the happening. I hope that explains a little bit about what people are, are Googling and talking about in terms of uh, you know reducing the subsidy and having the network rely more on fees. Uh, if, if you like this video, like, comment, share, subscribe. Thanks. To learn more about Bitcoin, you can check out the next video in the playlist and subscribe to this channel.